To what degree is language, this is uh, returning to Chomsky a little bit, mm -hmm. is, is innate? You said that for Chomsky, he used the idea that language is, some aspects of language are innate to explain away certain things that are observed. But do, how much are we born I, I, with language at the core of our mind, brain? I mean, I, I you know, the answer is I don't know, of course. But uh, the, uh, I mean, I, I like to, I'm an engineer at heart, I guess, and I sort of think it's fine to postulate that a lot of it's learned. And so I, I, I'm guessing that a lot of it's learned. So I think the reason Chomsky went with the innateness is because he, he, he hypothesized movement in his grammar. He was interested in grammar and movement's hard to learn. I think he's right. Movement is a hard, it's a hard thing to learn, to learn these two things together and how they interact. And there's like a lot of ways in which you might generate exactly the same sentences and it's like really hard. And so he's like, oh, I guess it's learned. Sorry, so I guess it's not learned, it's innate. Mm -hmm. And um, if you just throw out the movement and just think about that in a different way, you know, then you you get some messiness, but the messiness is human language, which it, it actually fits better. It's a, that messiness isn't a problem. It's actually a, 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 a it's a valuable asset of of uh, of the theory. And so, so I think I don't really see a reason to postulate much, much innate structure. And that's kind of why I think these large language models are learning so well, mm -hmm. is because I think you can learn the form, the forms of human language from the input. I think that's like, it's likely to be true. So that part of the brain that lights up when you're doing all the comprehension, that could be learned. That could be just, yeah. from, you don't need, you yeah. don't need any. It doesn't have to be innate. So like lots of stuff is um, modular in the brain that's learned. It doesn't have to, you know, so, there's something called the visual word form area in the back. And so it's in the back of your head <laughs> near the, you know, the visual cortex, okay? And that is very specialized language, sorry, very, very specialized brain area, which does um, visual word processing if you read, if you're a reader, okay? If you don't read, you don't have it, okay? Guess what? You spend some time learning to read and you develop that, that brain area, which does exactly that. And so these, the modularization is not evidence for innateness. So the modularization of a language area doesn't mean we're born with it. We could have easily learned that. I, I, we might have been born with it. I, I, it we, just, we just don't know at this point. We might very well have been born with this left lateralized area. I mean, the, there's like a lot of other interesting f components here, it, f features of this kind of argument. So some people get a stroke or something goes really wrong on the left side, where the left la where the language area would be, and that and that isn't there. It's not not available, and it develops just fine on the right. So it's no it's, so it's not about the left. Mm -hmm. it, it, it goes to the left. Like this is a very interesting question. It's like why is the why are any of the brain areas the way that they are, and how 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 did they come to be that way? And uh, you know, we, there's these natural experiments which happen where people get these you know strange events in their brains at very young ages, which wipe out sections of their brain, and and they behave totally normally, and no one knows anything was wrong. And we find out later because they happen to be accidentally scanned for some reason. It's like what what happened to your left hemisphere? It's missing. There's not many people who miss their whole left hemisphere, but they'll mm -hmm. be missing some other section of their left or their right. And they behave absolutely normally. We'd never know. So that's like a very interesting, you know, current research. <laughs> you know, this is another project that this person, M. Fedorenko, is working on. She's got all these people contacting her because she's scanned some people mm -hmm. who have been missing sections. One person missing missed a section of her brain and was scanned in her lab. Mm -hmm. And and she and she happened to be a writer for the New York Times. And there was an article in the New York Times about about uh, the uh, just about the scanning procedure and and about what might be learned about by sort of the general process of MRI and language and not sure, necessarily sure. language. And and because she's writing for the New York Times, and she, so all these people started writing to her, <laughs> who, then, who also have similar similar kinds of deficits because they've been you know accidentally, you know, scanned for some reason and uh, and found out they're missing some section. They and they, say, they volunteer to be scanned. So these are look, natural yeah, experiments. Natural experiments. They're kind of messy, but natural experiments. Brain. It's kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 she calls the, them interesting brains. The first few hours, days, months of human life are fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. uh, well, inside the womb, actually, like that development. That machinery, whatever that is, seems to create powerful humans that are able to speak, comprehend, think, all that kind of stuff, no matter what happens, not no matter what, but uh, robust to the different ways that uh, um, 
the 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 brain might be damaged and so on. That that's really that's really interesting. But uh, what what would Chomsky say about the fact, the thing you're saying now that language is is seems to be happening separate from thought? Because as far as I understand, maybe you can correct me. He thought that language underpins. Uh, yeah, he thinks so. I don't know what he'd say. He would be surprised because for him, the idea is that language is the sort of the foundation of thought. That's right. Absolutely. And it's pretty uh, mind blowing to think that it could be completely separate from thought. That's right. But so, you know, he's basically a philosopher, philosopher of language in a way, thinking about these things. It's a fine thought. You can't test it in his methods. You can't do a thought experiment to figure that out. You need a scanner. You need brain damaged people. You need something. You need ways to, to measure that. And that's what, you know, fMRI offers as a, and, 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 you know, patients are a little messier. fMRI is pretty unambiguous, I'd say. <laughs> it's like very unambiguous. There's no way to say that the language network is doing any of these tasks. There's, there's like, you, you should look at those data. It's like, there's no chance that you can say that the, they're, those networks are overlapping. They're not overlapping. They're just like completely different. And so, uh, you know, so the, the, you know, you can always make, you know, it's only two people, it's four people or something for the brain, the patients. And there's something special about them. We don't know, but these are just random people mm -hmm. and, and with lots of them and you find always the same effects and it's very robust, I'd say. Well, it's so. a fascinating effect. Yeah.